So good afternoon, everybody. Great to see you. I'm glad we did not have to cancel today's program. That's great. I'm Janice Kaminer Resnick, and I welcome you on behalf of our leadership team, former Congressman Mel Levine, former Los Angeles County Supervisor Zev Yaroslavsky, and myself. We are very pleased today to welcome our guest, Roy Teixeira, and tonight's moderator, the wonderful Madeline Brand. As I just said a few moments ago on Sunday at 11 a.m. Pacific, we'll hear from former Israeli ambassador to the United States and former member of the Israeli Knesset, Michael Oren. Aside from his impressive career as a diplomat, Michael is an essayist, a historian, a novelist, and a politician. He's written lots of books of, to great acclaim. We hope you will join us on Sunday for Israel and Crisis Briefing number 12 to be moderated by Larry Mantle. And next week, we have another great program on April 17th at 5 p.m. Pacific. We're delighted to welcome Barbara McQuaid, who those of you who watch M MSNBC see her all the time as a legal analyst for MSNBC. She served as a U.S. attorney for the Eastern District of Michigan, but stepped down in March 2017 as part of the former president's politically charged wholesale dismissal of 46 U.S. attorneys. She's now a professor of law at University of Michigan, and she will discuss her new book, mm. which is Attack from Within, How Disinformation is Sabotaging America. And it should be a very interesting program in conversation with UC Irvine School of Law's media law scholar, Henry Weinstein, who was the former legal reporter for the LA Times, the New York Times, San Francisco Examiner, and the Wall Street Journal. It should be a great program. Now let me introduce our wonderful, esteemed moderator, Madeline Brand. Madeline is the host of the award-winning daily news and culture show, Press Play. On the show, she covers national, international, and local stories. Uh, she's also co-host of KCRW, that's our local NPR affiliate, their legal affairs podcast, The Legal Evil Files. Madeline has hosted and reported for NPR and for affiliate stations for more than 30 years, and she teaches documentary radio at her alma mater, the Columbia Graduate School of Journalism. So now I let me turn the program over to Madeline. Madeline? Thank you so much, Janice. Great to be back with you and excited to talk to Mar guest for this evening, Rui Teixeira, longtime political demographer and pundit, senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and politics editor of the Liberal Patriot Newsletter. His new book with John Judas is called Where Have All the Democrats Gone? Well, we're going to find out hopefully this hour. Two decades ago, the two wrote a book that was hugely influential in political circles. It is called The Emerging Democratic Majority. And in it, they argued that demographics meant Democrats could be in power for many political cycles with a winning coalition of young people, of women, of minorities, and college-educated liberal professionals. President Obama used that coalition to win the White House and to win re-election. But then... Of course, 2016 and Donald Trump, and we learned that one important group has really left the Democrats, and that's the white working class. Brewey and John's new book attempts to explain what went wrong and what the Democrats need to do to keep Donald Trump out of the White House a second time. Brewey, welcome. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me, and I, I want to apologize for uh, having been so late getting on. I'm at this conference, and I had to run around to three different buildings to find a place that's at least sort of quiet. You may hear some people, you know, coming in and out, but hopefully this is, uh, they won't disturb us too much. Well, but yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah. And uh, I'm happy to try to explain uh, this great conundrum that is today's Democratic Party and its uh, seeming inability to put away Trump and the Republicans. Right. Well, okay. So explain that because on the face <clears throat> of it, it looks like the Democrats are doing pretty well. Uh, Joe Biden won more votes than any other presidential candidate in history when he won in 2020. And uh, so, and he is in power and the Democrats are in power in the Senate. They just mm -hmm. narrowly are not in power in the House. So what is the problem? Well, um, I think I wouldn't pay too much attention to the absolute number of votes. A lot of that is determined by population growth and turnout. I mean, for example, Obama got a higher share of the vote than, than he did both times Obama ran. So, uh, you know, these things are relative to population, relative to turnout. But yeah, he did He did beat Trump. I mean, the thing that was a little disturbing about that election for those who followed it was he didn't really win by that much. He was supposed, he ran far behind what the polls were showing in terms of, uh, you know, his lead against Trump. And it wound up as famously in just a handful of states by a few tens of thousands of votes. So it's extremely close. And in the process, they lost 12 House seats. 
<clears throat> again, that was sort of not supposed to happen because it was supposed to be a big blue wave against Trump. Um, and and as the really disturbing thing underneath that disturbing thing was how poorly Democrats did among working class voters. That really the fundamental reason why Biden wins that election at all is because of a shift of white college graduates in his direction. That's true both overall and in the states that he won. He actually did worse among Hispanic working class voters. He did somewhat worse among black working class voters. And he actually lost the overall non-college vote by about four points, the first time a Democrat has done that in a long, long time. Um, and, you know, people thought, again, that this would be much more of a, a uniform swing in a big way against Trump and the Republicans. And people were particularly shocked to see the Democrats' margin among Hispanics drop by 18 points and among uh, Hispanic working class voters by more than that, about 20 or 22 points. So this is all, was all very disturbing about how he lacked coattails, about the working class defections from uh, the coalition. And of course, those working class co defections, again, driven by these minority or non-white voters, <laughs> came on top of a massive bailout from the Democrats of white working class voters in 2016, without which Trump doesn't win the election. Mm -hmm. So they've been sort of leaving past... since Reagan. Hmm? Hadn't they been leaving since Reagan? Well, yeah, they 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 have they left in sort of tranches, as it were. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the sort of back in the day, Democrats did quite well among white working class voters. Um, and uh, you know, that was sort of the bulwark of their coalition. You could really see them start to leave uh, in 68, 72, then in 80, 84. Then actually uh, Clinton does better, at least in a plurality sense, among the white working class uh, in the 90s. And then it kind of snaps back to a poor performance in the early 00s uh, with Gore and Kerry. <clears throat> Kerry especially uh, did worse among white working class voters than any Democratic candidate had done in a long, long time. And then Obama kind of brings them back into the fold to some extent, right? Um, he did better among white working class voters, both in 2008 and 2012 than a lot of people expected. And one of the key things about the 2012 election, which worried us, John Judas and I, when thinking about the way things were trending, is people tended to interpret that election as the return of the Obama coalition. It was really about turning out their base, about turning out these rising demographics. And in reality, the reason why Biden, I mean, Biden Obama was able to win that election was because of a swing back relative to 2010 by white working class voters toward the Democrat, toward Barack Obama in the upper Midwest. And without that, he doesn't win the election. But that, that problem, that warning sign was sort of ignored. The Democrats had another terrible election in 2014. And then, of course, 2016 happens when larger shifts take place against the Democrats than anyone had believed were possible. And that was enough for, for Trump to win the election. So, you know, the, it's a long goodbye, <laughs> especially among white working class voters to the Democrats. And it does go back to the late 20th century, but it's just accelerated in this century. And now it seems to be just a permanent feature of the landscape. <clears throat> right now, for example, Trump is doing massively well among white working class voters, as one would expect, probably somewhat better than he did in 2020, which is already pretty good. And you know, to return to the theme here, one of the themes here, non-white working class voters uh, are actually moving toward Trump, at least according to the polls, in a fairly substantial way. So you see non-white working class voters starting to vote more like white working class voters, which doesn't mean that the margins Democrats have <clears throat> among Hispanics or Blacks working class voters are like their white working class. But, but you know, you could see there's a, there's a certain commonality of trend among mm -hmm. the white working class voters. And again, where the Democrats are picking up votes is not from any sectors of the working class. It's from college graduates, particularly white college graduates. It's, Patrick Ruffini, who's an excellent Republican analyst, has observed, he wrote a good book about a lot of these trends called Party of the People. The only demographic the Democrats have done better on among since 2012 is white college graduates. That's it. And um, is it your argument that without 
substantial portions of the working class, white or non-white, Democrats can't win? Oh, no, they can win. It's just a question of A, uh, how difficult is it going to be? And B, what kind of party does that make you when the Republicans actually become the party, the dominant party among working class voters writ large? And it does, it does mean you're sort of already teetering on the precipice, right? Most voters in this country are working class, like two thirds of eligible voters are non-college or working class. It's higher than that in most of the key swing states, for example, in this election. So it doesn't mean mathematically you can win, even if you do badly or even worse among uh, working class voters, you can make it up among the college educated. If you ramp up their vote enough, it's possible. Um, and Democrats are hoping to some extent that'll be the story of, of this election. Um, in 2022, then they did quite well. They did benefit from, relatively well, they did benefit from, again, this, this strong support among college educated voters. Um, and we look at the polls today, you know, you literally see this inversion. You see Biden's up by like 20 points among the college educated, and he's down by 15 points on average among the working class, which is significantly worse than in, okay. than in 2020. Oh. Right. So explain it to me. Is it a Biden problem or is it a Democrat problem? Because Biden is constantly emphasizing his Scranton roots, his working, mm -hmm. his working class roots. He is not someone who is associated with Silicon Valley, Wall Street elitism. And in his in his tenure, not only in the Senate, but in the presidency, he mm -hmm. has done a lot to advocate for middle America. And as a, as president, he's passed the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, the CHIPS Act, infrastructure, forgiving student loans, supporting the auto worker strikes, all of these things that would help working class people. Um, and so I'm wondering, what's the disconnect there between the voters? What How do they see Biden if they're not connecting with his policies, which arguably would help? working class voters. Right, well, there's some, um, there's in a sense, uh, part of the long goodbye of the working class to the Democrats. Again, go, it does go back to the late 20th century and the Democrats association with what you might call a soft neoliberal model of, uh, of sort of economic policy and economic practice that um, did not sit well with a lot of voters in, in left behind areas of the country. Uh, the Democrats ceased to become the party that was automatically associated with keeping the country prosperous. Uh, again, this was mostly among white working class voters, but there was already a sense the Democrats weren't quite the party they once were. And I think that throughout until recently, the Democrats really were primarily associated with a kind of soft neoliberalism. Now we see that this is just speaking in strictly economic terms. We see this changing a bit under Biden where he does uh, embrace a sort of industrial policy. He does try to present himself as the pro-union, pro-working class president, but there's, there's several problems with that. One is that working class people look back on the Trump years before COVID, and they actually have a much more positive view of Trump's economic management and their experience under that than they did under Biden. A lot of that has to do with inflation, cost of living. I mean, this was huge for working class voters. It's much easier for relatively affluent educated voters to forgive a spike of inflation and a lengthy period of relatively high inflation than it is for working class voters. So the view of a lot of working class voters about Biden is heavily colored by what they think happened to their pocketbooks, to their wages not keeping up with inflation until recently. And just, you know, the fact so many things cost so much more <laughs> than when Biden took office. That's a big problem. Now, you can look at things like the infrastructure bill. You can look at the Chips and Science Act. You can look at the Inflation Reduction Act. And you can argue, well, OK, I mean, this is Biden. He's investing in America. This is going to lift up everybody. The problem is that most working class people don't see it yet. Maybe they'll see it in the future, but they don't see a lot of this. This investment is, is notional. It's going to take a long time to roll out, and some of it might not even work, right? I mean, the Inflation Reduction Act, for example, is a heavily climate-focused bill, and most working-class voters don't really care that much about climate change. Yeah. Uh, you know, and they don't want to drive an electric vehicle. I mean, <laughs> they don't really care whether their, their energy is from wind and solar or from, from gas and nuclear or whatever. So uh, 
there's a difference between the rhetoric adopted by someone like Biden uh, and the policies that he might have been able to push through and the experiences and views and lived experience, as it were, of, of working class voters, which can be, which can be quite different. Um, and you know, then we, we haven't really talked about culture, but that's a big part of it too. I mean, the Democrats have, and we have a whole section in our book called Cultural Radicalism, where the Democrats, I think it's fair to say, have moved fairly sharply to the left on most sociocultural issues uh, that, that are really in tune with a lot of their college educated supporters, the more liberal elements of their constituencies with the activist groups, um, with the foundations, with the nonprofits. I mean, there's, there's, there's a, this massive infrastructure we call the shadow party in our book that all pretty much sings out of the same hymn book as opposed to a vector as, as a vector of those issues are concerned. And that's moved the Democrats out of the wheelhouse of a lot of working class voters. They're not okay, interested that, in these issues. Let me get think. to that in a little bit. I just want to okay. stick. But with... I just, yeah, it's both economic, but I'm just saying there's an interaction between economics and culture and you can't right. understand one without the other. I, yeah, and I was going to ask you that because, uh, you know, if it is just about economics, then it would be cyclical right? Because there's only so much the president can do about inflation, if anything. And so that's kind of, these are world economic cycles that are, uh, that are hitting voters. Well, uh, there's also the long-term issue of how working class people have done in the country, as opposed to college educated people, as opposed to profess knowledge economy professionals. There's the issue of which parts of the country have prospered, while other parts of the country have not. So there are long-term trends that I think figure into how uh, so why are the know, working class voters complained from that when well, it, it's, it's they, starting. They participated in, in the uh, evolution of the economy toward, you know, sort of the, remember the free trade deals from the 90s, remember the shock, China shock from the early 2000s? So people were very unhappy about that. They participated in the deregulation of aspects of the financial industry, which eventually bit pretty hard. And there was a sense that Democrats, Democrats, at least until relatively recently, have been associated with an economic model that's more, you know, let business do what business does uh, and let's trade with, you know, let's sort of open up the country to as much trade as we can and bring in cheap consumer goods and, uh, and eventually everyone will benefit, right? And we'll compensate the losers. And, you know, there's actually a very interesting paper by Thuresh Nadu et al., a bunch of economists who looked at the evolution of democratic economic policy from the 70s through today and track the way in which it changed over time from you know, sort of the classical New Deal conception uh, toward this sort of um, compensate the losers. And I think that's, that's a hard thing for the Democrats to shake. It does mean they love the Republicans, but one thing that Trump did was very important. You can't understand how he did so well without this. He blew up the Republican consensus in favor of a hard neoliberalism, right? Uh, you know, markets determine everything. You should interfere with them as little as possible. You should cut taxes as much as possible. We should try to reform, quote unquote, entitlement programs. The problem with America is it's not friendly enough to big business. And Trump said, no, that's not the problem. The pro you problem you have, working class person out there, is the elites of both the Republican and Democratic Party don't care about you. They're interested in themselves. They're interested in the parts of the country they live in. They're interested in lining their own pockets. Uh, and I'm not like that. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to change. I'm going to make everything great. Now, of course, <laughs> you can argue, uh, you know, he's not, Trump hasn't been and isn't a real policy guy. So it's not like he had this fantastic real plan that would make everything better. But it was quite appealing to a lot of working class voters. And uh, so, I don't so think does you can understand not matter then? Without that. I guess Oops. I'm wondering if, if the policy part doesn't really matter then, that it is about culture, it is about um personality, character, uh, I don't know, emotion rather than anything substantive because, I mean, if it was always mm -hmm. infrastructure week in the Trump presidency, it actually was infrastructure week in the Biden presidency, but does that actually not well, matter? Well, the fact that it wasn't infrastructure week and the infrastructure week never really happened under Trump and it did kind of happen under Biden. And again, you have to look at it from the standpoint of the ordinary working class voter who has never that thrilled about the idea of infrastructure week anyway. It was just something Trump said. It sounded good, but if it happened or didn't, it wasn't like a make or break thing for them. Um, so, uh, you know, Trump is, um, policy matters, but policy matters over a relatively long period of time. If you wanna 
really talk about policies and their effects. People, uh, voters will reward you, including working class voters, if they associate a policy that has been carried through with improving their lives in a direct sense. Um, the Democrats aren't there yet in this series of, of things that they, they put through. And look, I mean, Trump, you know, it was one part of his problem in 2020. He talked a lot and he hadn't accomplished much and people were tired of his governing style and just like, ah, let's throw this guy out and try Biden. He seems like a normal kind of dude. You know, he'll sort of make, bring the country back to sanity. Um, but the Democrats have a long way to go, I think, before they convince working class voters, especially, that they have the problem of American economics solved. They're really going to move us into the future. Your lives are going to be better. Trust us on this. Um, and you have to be very cognizant of that as a party, I think, and realize how long that's going to take and how strong a governing coalition you have to have to make that happen. And how you can't be moving so far to the left on a series of issues that really annoy working class voters, because that's just going to undercut your coalition and you're not going to be able to be in power long enough and do long enough to actually improve the lives of these voters in a big way. So, you know, that, that's part of the theme of our, our book is how a series of decisions and trends uh, that have happened to the Democratic Party in the last 20 years, um, though some of them go back farther, have undercut their ability to put together that kind of dominant coalition. And we do have this sort of stalemate between the Republicans and Democrats. I mean, Biden barely wins in 2020. He may not win in 2024. Democrats barely control the Senate. They'll probably lose it in 2024. They might take back the House by a few seats. You see it in, you know, various states in terms of governors and state legislatures. It's all over the place. There's no real dominant party now. Um, and, you know, the Democrats, they just aren't competitive in vast areas of the country uh, that do feel left behind, that are more ruralish. Um, Democrats used to be competitive in a lot of these places. They aren't anymore. And that really reduces their degrees of freedom in terms of building a dominant uh, political coalition. And our argument is that that's a problem. I mean, the Democrats can't really do what they want to do or what they would like to do and stay in power long enough to really make it happen unless they pay more attention to what working class voters actually feel and think and move to the center in appropriate ways and become more, you know, what the Democrats, when they were, when Democrats were, <laughs> make Democrats great again, right? I mean, back when they were the party of the common man and woman of the ordinary American without fear or favor, trying to universally uplift everybody. That was the right approach. And, and the and Democrats you don't think said, that they're, they're think, trying to do that now, and they're being stymied by the the other party when it comes to. Well, they're obviously being stymied by the other party, but they're also like associated with a series of positions on various aspects of race, gender, sexuality, crime, immigration, and so on that aren't aren't very comfortable for working class voters. I mean, the whole emphasis on you know, structural racism, on racial equity, on, you know, sort of, I mean, obviously the Supreme Court's sort of monkey wrench into that, but the idea that what public policy should be about is remedying as aggressively as possible racial disparities is not a way, for example, just to pick one, one thing, that you build up a sense, you know, your party is the party of the common man and woman of the working and middle classes. Um, and people notice this stuff and they don't like it. Um, and I don't think it really does any good for, for the people we should really care about anyway, which are the black and Hispanic poor and working class who uh, their lives are difficult materially and their problem is they wanna get ahead. And we should figure out, we need to figure out how to do that. And that's complicated and that takes time. They're not, I mean, the black professional class, for example, they benefit from a lot of the hoopla about structural racism and sort of the ways in which labor market decisions are made within corporations now, the whole diversity, equity, inclusion stuff. Um, but I think this doesn't do anything for the Black working class, very little. And I think that's what's important. But is that what you're hearing from the Biden White House, that they're they're campaigning on that idea and talking about that? Because I'm-, I'm Well, not... this gets to the interesting question of, you know, Biden is like more normal <laughs> and, and seems in a sense to the right of the- Democratic Party as a whole in terms of how he presents. But right. people notice what the party image is and what the party is associated with. And that 
is very important to how the party is perceived in different areas of the country. Most races now are nationalized. And Biden, as normal as he attempts to be, you know, Joe from Scranton and all that jazz, um, you know, he's inevitably a creature of the party. I mean, he's not a guy who's going to break with the consensus of the party on any of these issues. And we'll see what it does in immigration. There's some interesting action there. But uh, it's not it's not the way he rolls, you know. He's not a, he's not a Bill Clinton. He's not a guy who's going to draw a line in the sand or have a sister soldier moment or say, you know, I'm a different kind of Democrat. He's just a Democrat, and the Democrats have evolved in a certain way, and he's kind of stuck with it. But how is he how is he rolling with, as you call it, the shadow party, which is, um, as you define it, the far left of the party? Um, on these social issues, like what is he doing materially that that would endorse that view? Well, I mean, look at what happened on the border. I mean, the moment he came into office, he you know, repealed a lot of Trump executive orders, basically sent out a lot of signals that it was going to be a lot easier. I mean, under the guise of being humane, it was going to be a lot. But that was interpreted as meaning it was a lot easier to get into the United States. And in fact, that was the asylum system is very loose and porous. The parole system has been used. You just look Look at the data. There's this massive increase in illegal immigration over the Mexico border. And look, I mean, the tr Biden has drunk the Kool-Aid uh, about how we talk about immigration to the extent that, as you may recall, in the State of the Union address when he was being hectored about uh, the woman in, in Georgia who got killed, you know, allegedly killed by an illegal immigrant, he referred to that person as an illegal immigrant. And he, he apologized two days later for referring to an illegal immigrant as illegal. You know, that's the kind of, that's, that's where the Democratic Party is coming from. It's an approved vocabulary and approved attitude toward all kinds of issues which Biden is indelibly associated with. Um, and you have the at, Democrats yeah. actually um, agreeing to this legislation that in previous years they they would have never agreed to, which is pretty much everything the Republicans wanted. And it was the Republicans who killed it. Well, so it wasn't everything the Republicans wanted, but it was not an unreasonable compromise. And the problem is it's a little late in the day for that. And there were elements of the Republican Party who weren't happy with it, particularly Trump, and they they killed it. But you know that doesn't obviate the fact, and this is very important for the way voters look at things. I mean, the Biden campaign is obviously going to make the point, oh, What's the problem here? We, you know, we're, we would have closed down the border as soon as we got this legislation through. It's great, you know. We we were really trying, and uh, they got in our way. But what voters notice is what they've seen happen over the entire course of the Biden presidency, which is the whole situation strikes most voters as having essentially gotten out of control with the levels of illegal immigration that have come in, the diffusion of these immigrants uh, to different areas of the country. They put strain and resources in a lot of cities. People are very unhappy about that. Biden's approval rating on immigration is, is through the floor. It's as low as 20% in some polls. So um, it's hard to make the case here for border security uh, and sort of turn the tables and say, well, it's just those nasty Republicans who wouldn't agree to our bipartisan uh, bill. And now Biden realizes that's not going to cut the mustard in terms of this particular issue. And he's now apparently toying with using the executive sort of tools he has at his disposal to make asylum a lot harder and to close the border in certain ways to uh, the situation there. And he, he may do it, but you know, uh, what happens on your watch is what you're blamed for. And it did happen on his watch, so he's blamed for it. And it's not gonna turn it around for Biden and certainly some parts of the party to try to say, well, now that we think about it, maybe border security is, is kind of important. Um, how much of this is defined by the other side? In other words, a big, I, I, you know, maybe taking immigration out of that because mm -hmm. numbers are absolutely correct in terms of the amount of people at the southern border now, but mm -hmm. it is endlessly talked about on Fox News and endlessly talked about by Donald Trump and other Republican candidates. Mm -hmm. And so how much of that is influencing the voters versus their actual, you know, when it comes to that or when it comes to anything like, quote unquote, woke politics or trans rights or anything like that? Is that actually what the average voter cares about? Or is it something that just becomes something that they care about because it's incessantly talked about? Uh, in mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. Well, I call that the Fox News fallacy. And I think that is a 
a comforting way that many Democrats think about a lot of these contentious issues where they do appear to be vulnerable and where the other side hits them pretty hard on it. If Fox News or the conservative bet noir of your choice is talking about a given issue, be it crime, be it immigration, be it trans issues, be it even inflation, it's not really a problem. They're making it up. I mean, they're, they're trying to deceive the, the honest people, honest voters of America. And it, the whole thing wouldn't be an issue unless they talked about it. Just like this famous headline I saw once in the post, you know, crime is spiking in Fox News coverage, in parentheses. So, I mean, this is just shows, this is the kind of thing that makes Democrats appear clueless. People do care about crime. They do care about border security. They do, in fact, they're not, in fact, on board with the trans revolution. I mean, they're not, they don't think people should be discriminated against, but most people, most voters in the United States don't think that trans-identified males should play on women's sports teams. They don't think that if someone, you know, says that if a trans-identified male says they're a woman, that makes them a woman, exactly, no questions asked. They don't, have, they don't actually support the extent to which puberty blockers, hormones, and surgery are available for, for minors at this point. They'd like to see more regulation of that. You can look at what's happening. But, but how big of an issue really is that? As you said earlier, people really care about how much they're paying for eggs. Do they really care if somebody's yeah, using- they care about it because they feel it's, you know, culturally something they're, they're unhappy about. They think it's ridiculous. They think their kids are going to be taught this stuff. They think that, you know, why do people not like stuff? It's because it seems unlikable. And the fact that Republicans are informing this of this issue and they hear about it all, they may in fact have a presence in their community. It's not like you'd have to, you know, be Rip Van Winkle at this point and gone to sleep for 10 years if you didn't think the trans issue was a lot bigger deal than it was 10 years ago. So uh, I agree, that's not the most salient issue for voters. I think immigration's more salient, crime's more salient. And of course the economy and inflation is, is, is more salient. But I would not make the mistake of thinking nobody would care about the Biden administration or the Democratic Party support for so-called gender affirming care if it wasn't for those naughty people at Fox News. I mean, they would say the same. I mean, the right says exactly the same thing about the left, right? A lot of the things the left criticizes for. Nobody would even think about it if it wasn't for MSNBC and the New York Times and the Washington Post. I, I reject that thinking by and large. I don't think the media has that much power, though it obviously plays a role in our political ecosystem. Okay, so speaking of social issues, what about, let's talk about abortion. We just had mm -hmm. that ruling in Arizona and which uh, basically codifies a, a Civil War era statute when it comes to abortion access, mm -hmm. basically uh, outlawing all forms of abortion. You've got Florida as well passing mm -hmm. a state ban. Does that, is that a gift politically to the Democrats? Uh, is Florida now in play and Arizona much more likely to, to end up in the Democratic column? I'd say Florida is not in play. <clears throat> I mean, it may make it a little easier for Democrats to take Arizona, though Biden is currently running behind Trump. But one thing that's very important to realize about the abortion rights issue is not that it definitely favors the Democrats. In a sense, yes, it was a the Dobbs decision was a gift to Democrats and it clearly helped them in 2022. Uh, though, you know, Republicans did take back the House, they carried the House for popular vote, blah, blah, blah. Lots of people who were hard, relatively hardline in abortion like Kemp and, and De, uh, like DeWine actually won their election. So, but at the margin, it did help. And being associated, I mean, basically it allowed the Democrats, and this is what Trump's trying to get out of now, there's a substantial faction of the Republican Party that doesn't just want limits on abortion, which is actually people are probably okay with, depending on how it's presented. I mean, it's standard in Western industrialized countries. There are some limits, but they think they're just going to ban it, just like this abortion law in, in Arizona. And that people really don't like that. They're, I mean, that's a, it's a consensus position, except for maybe 25% of the country that you know, abortion should be available, generally speaking, in the first three months, and then with some exceptions, and then thereafter with some exceptions. I mean, it depends on what you put the cut off. But the basic idea is people think it's draconian and wrong to have a flat out abortion limit. So Republicans in 2022 tried to wiggle out of it, <clears throat> some of the more reasonable people by 
saying, well, you know, but that's not really what we mean. You know, we're really just for, you know, reasonable limit. And it was very hard to play at that time in the wake of the Dobbs decision. Now, Trump is cleverly saying, okay, this is a difficult issue. I get it. You know, I'm a pro-life guy myself, but by God, this Dobbs decision leaves it up to the states. So by God, let's leave it up to the states. You see Kerry Lake in Arizona already saying, oh, that's a terrible decision. I'm not for that at all. And you'll see the same thing in a lot of other states where this comes up. So the Republicans are taking evasive action. And then sort of underneath that, there's a fundamental point. There's tons of pro-choice voters in this country who are quite willing to vote Republican. You had you know, people who are willing to vote pro-choice in a referendum and then turn, out, turn around and vote for a relatively conservative Republican at the same time as happened in Ohio. So it's not a magic bullet. It's not like the Republicans being on the wrong side of this issue automatically negate other aspects of the culture war and any other advantages Republicans have. And like everybody who has a somewhat pro-choice position will never vote Democratic because that's the most important issue to them. No, it's not actually. I mean, the 2022 and especially the 20 uh, special elections of 2023 drew out exactly the kind of voters who are the most active, most engaged, most educated, and are more likely to be animated by this issue. The peripheral voters will be drawn into the 2024 election are much less likely to be that jazzed by the abortion issue and certainly to vote on its basis. I mean, look, if you ask people, you know, what's the most important issue in the United States or going into this election, you know, either closed-ended or open-ended, abortion doesn't rank that highly. I mean, it's clearly important for some voters, and those voters are probably already going to vote Democratic. But, uh, you know, as a, as a magic, as a key to unlocking the rest of the electorate for the Democrats, I'm, I'm quite skeptical. But, you know, on that, it's, it's a good issue for them. There's, there's no doubt about that. Republicans are desperately trying to figure out how to present a different face on this. And as I say, I think Trump is pretty clever to say, well, OK, you want a different regime in your state? Fine, vote for it. Right. And he did not support or come out at least in support of a nationwide ban. So but when it comes to slicing up the electorate, because Ooh. now it's little slices that each candidate has to win. What about the suburban mm -hmm. woman who might be, might have voted Republican, might have voted for uh, Mitt Romney, um, but looks at this and says, oh my gosh, I can't, you know, this is an important issue for me. Isn't that a key voting block for winning this right. election? A lot of suburban college educated women have already moved into the Democratic Party over time. Again, remember what I said about the only demographic that's moved in the Democrats' direction since 2012 is white college-educated voters, and that's particularly white college-educated women. Uh, and so, we, you know, this is just, this may add something to the secular trend, but the secular trend is already there. And remember, a lot of, there are a lot of suburban women who are not college-educated, who are more working class. In fact, most women who live in the suburbs are not college-educated. Um, so we shouldn't collapse the suburban female vote simply to the proto sort of the, I think the standard thing you'd think like, you know, around where I live, some college educated woman, white woman who lives in Montgomery County, right? It's much more complicated than that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, but I think this is certainly something the Democrats hope will happen. Again, I think the 2024 electorate is going to be a different electorate than the 2022 or 2023 electorate. Uh, but I think they they do hope. I mean, they look they look the same polls I do. They see how badly Biden's doing with working class voters. They're hoping that they can improve their margin very significantly among college educated women in the suburbs. And it's a que the question is is there how much more juice can they squeeze from that? Uh, is it enough to compensate for losses in other places? And even you know, is it really even the key to the votes of those women? Uh, it, for a certain slice of them, I think, a liberal, white, college-educated woman in the suburbs, they, they were like up in arms about this stuff. But how many of those people are going to vote for the Republicans anyway? <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> you slice it, dice it, and there's a lot of different, you know, groups you can look at. And you can always make the mathematical case, this is something I talk about a lot, that given a enough improvement in any given sector of the electorate, you can make up for losses in another sector of the electorate. But, you know, this is, 
it gets speculative after a while and, and almost like a, it's just a mathematical truism. It doesn't tell you a lot about how people are, are trending. And when we look at the polls today, part of what they're telling us to get back to your question about suburban women is Democrats aren't making enough gains among those voters to make up for the losses among working class voters. Now that could change by November, yeah. absolutely. But so we're, even, we're not seeing it so far. Even though Biden, oh. we discussed earlier, is, you know, does Trump at his working class roots and is, I think, at least rhetorically and substantively in terms of his legislation, mm -hmm. trying mm -hmm. to appeal to that voting block. Is there a Democrat, and, and yet is losing those voters, is there a Democrat who is doing it right and is holding on to that sector of the electorate? Well, it's, uh, well there's certainly people who've done better, but, you know, it's a little bit hard to read off of that, how they would do in a national context like Biden has to deal with. I mean, you can look at someone like Josh Shapiro in Pennsylvania. He's done quite well. He has a high approval rating. He did really well among white working class voters. And actually, John Fetterman did quite well as well. And he's actually sort of carved out an interesting path for himself in terms of separating him and his brand from some of the ways the Democratic Party has evolved. Um, you know, I think, but again, that's just Pennsylvania. It's just one state. I don't know how that would translate to the party as a whole, uh, you know, being their standard bearer. I mean, I think a lot of the people are talked about as potential successors for Biden, like Kamala Harris, like Gavin Newsom, like J.B. Pritzker. I think they're all pretty much down the line avatars of uh, the Brahmin left <laughs> Democratic Party we have today that is so heavily based and influenced by college educated voters. Um, Gretchen Whitmer, you know, she's maybe a little bit better from us, uh, but I've got my doubts about her as well. Um, you know, there's the bench is thin, I think, in terms of those kind of candidates. I mean, everybody always used to talk about Sherrod Brown, but he'll be lucky if he just keeps his seat. Um, Jared Polis in, in Colorado is interesting, I think, though Colorado is a very idiosyncratic state. Uh, yeah, I mean, if I knew the exact answer to that, I'd uh, I'd go out and place a bet in Vegas or something, but uh, I, I don't. I guess, I guess I'm wondering in this day and age when everything is so polarized, to use an overused word, is it even possible to have a candidate who appeals to a broad sector of the electorate? Is it possible to pull in working class people in Pennsylvania and Silicon Valley elites? and put them together. Well, look, it wasn't so long ago that Obama did this. I mean, I guess you could argue that things have changed so much in the last, he only left office when Trump got elected, right? Or well, it's, they got elect, reelected in 2012. Okay, that's only 12 years ago. So I'm not so convinced that the polarization we see today is so entrenched and so immovable that no one could ever breach some of these divides. But I do think it depends on the party, either one of the parties, deciding they're going to move more aggressively toward the center of the country in terms of both cultural and economic issues. And I think that the Democratic Party could do that, but I think it'll take some, some doing. And if they did do that and put forward a candidate who sort of corresponded to those views, I think they could claw back a lot of this working class support without losing too much on the you know, college educated liberal end. I think it's quite possible. I think I think the Republicans, if you know, you could have a, a successor to Trump who is more in the lines of some of the Republican people who realize you have to be more moderate on social issues and you have to have an economic policy that's not maniacally focused on tax cuts and takes industrial policy and things like that seriously. Or in Cass at American Compass, there's a lot of good stuff on that. Julius Krein's journal American Affairs. There are some, but you know, the, these are of the intellectuals and some not important voices in the party. It is pretty Trumpified, but it may not be Trumpified forever. So I think the center of the American electorate is looking for someone who's more in their socially moderate to conservative, economically kind of liberal wheelhouse. Uh, I guess I, they, I still don't keep have it. why Biden's not that guy, because he is socially Because Biden is the president of these United States, and he's a Democrat. He's, he is the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party is him. He, he is he's, he's, not, he's not that moderate in terms of like, again, you look at things like immigration, you look at things like 
you know, sort of the whole gender ideology controversy. You look at the stuff around equity at the beginning of his administration. You look at the rhetoric he uses. A lot of, a lot of it is, he's a, I think of him as a designated normie of the Democratic Party. The problem is if your party is not viewed as being the normie voter party, you being Joe Biden with this long history does not necessarily convince people that, you know, the Democrats are a great party and, you know, you can, you can escape that. If Biden had pulled a Clinton maybe and decided he was going to uh, be a different kind of Democrat and break with some of the Democrats' less popular positions, maybe he could do it, but he hasn't. He hasn't. I mean, he projects normality. I agree with that. And he's he's not going to like give a national speech on, on something completely insane, but uh, he's not going to speak out against it either. I always thought they lost a, a really good opportunity when Chesa Boudin got cashiered from uh, being DA of San Francisco. It's a great opportunity to say, you could have had a Chesa Boudin moment. This man, you know, the voters of San Francisco have spoken. We realize, we Democrats realize public safety is first and foremost, we got to get the violent criminals off the street. There shouldn't be open air drug markets. You know, that's what we Democrats stand for. I'm a different kind of Democrat, but it didn't happen. And it won't happen because Biden's not that kind of guy. Okay, let me get to some of the uh, viewer questions. Ruth asks, okay. what role do you think third parties will play in this year's election, especially among Gen oh. Z voters and especially RFK Jr., who's doing fairly well among certain demographics, i.e. young Black men? My biggest concern, she says, is that this year's election will be a repeat of the 2016 election where third parties helped Trump win. Right. I mean, I think you can overestimate the extent to which uh, third parties really help Trump win. I think that the most important thing was the swing of white working class voters away from the Democrats toward Trump. But at the margin, it did help. Uh, and I think this election, to your viewers' question, we, we do have a possibility here. We can have a lot more third party vote. I mean, RFK Jr., you know, he could hit low, sub, low double digits. We don't know. But I mean, Stein and West will pull a little bit. Um, it's a very fluid environment and people are very dissatisfied with both candidates. There's a big pool of people out there, uh, including among some of these demographics the Democrats have relied upon, who might be willing to toy with the idea that maybe I should vote for RFK Jr. and Asa Kennedy. And, you know, you, I kind of like some of what he says. I didn't understand some of the rest of what he says, but that's okay. You know, we need to do something completely different. Uh, and so I think, I mean, and just in terms of raw data too, you look at the data, in uh, matchups that include Kennedy versus Trump versus Biden. And then if you add in uh, West and Stein, it varies by poll, but the average effect appears to be to hurt Biden at this point by a point or two. And obviously that could be very important in, a, in an election like this. And it does look like, you know, Kennedy will wind up being able to get on the swing state ballots, you know, so. So yeah, I think there's a lot to worry about that if you want Biden to, to squeak this one, squeak through on this one. Uh, third parties could definitely make the difference. RFK Jr. could be pretty important. But on the other hand, we know that historically third party support decays pretty rapidly as you get close to the election. So, you know, it's also possible by the time people vote, it'll, it won't even be that important a factor. I don't know, I don't have a crystal ball, but I do agree that it's something to worry about and to keep in eye on, and that does connect to the level of dissatisfaction in the country today, these willingness to like entertain these alternatives. What about young voters, Gen Z voters? I saw a story, I think it was in the New York Times recently, that showed that young voters are, for the first time, more aligned with Republicans than they are with Democrats. Well, not in terms of, <clears throat> not in terms of party identification, but it has been the case in a number of polls that Gen Z voters who are now like 18 to 27. So it's now almost the entire 18 to 29 age group. In some polls, they do, you know, sort of support Trump by small margins over Biden. And if you look at the averages across polls of the, you know, the youth subgroup, um, you do see what looks like a big fall off among this group relative to 2020, where they supported Biden by now their generational changes too at this point, but they supported Biden by what 23, 24 points. And now uh, Biden is averaging in the single digits in terms of his average level of support. And as as was you were mentioning, in some polls he's even Trump's even a little bit ahead. 
Now, I don't expect that to happen. I don't expect Trump to carry the youth vote, but I would not be surprised if the margin among young voters declined quite substantially. You know, if you go from 24 point lead to a 14 point lead, that's a 10 point margin shift. That's important. And I think that's entirely, you know, possible based on what we've seen so far. How how reliable are the polls when it comes to measuring not only young people, well, especially young people, but everyone these days? Um, can you actually rely on them, <laughs> especially with Gen Z voters who maybe don't answer their cell phones? Yeah, well, a lot of polls do include cell phones now, and uh, all, a lot of them do it online. You know, some do text messaging. Um, you know, there's an attempt to improve the methodology, and I do think the methodologies have improved. And there's been some, you know, recent election. 2022 actually was pretty good polling. We'll see how they do in 2024. But yeah, I think you need to take it with a grain of salt. And I think particularly when you're looking at subgroups like Hispanics or like 18 to 29 year olds, uh, there's some grounds for skepticism about whether they've actually got it right right now. On the other hand, that's the data we got. <laughs> and if you average the polls, you know, your default assumption should be they're probably there's probably a there there. Mm. It's unlikely that, for example, right now Biden is ahead by 24 points among 18 to 29 year olds, just like he was in 2020. And the polls are saying he's only ahead by eight points. And that's just totally an artifact of the reach in the wrong 18 to 29 year olds. That's a comforting story, but that gets you close, close to like the whole poll and skewing thing where people look at a poll they don't like and they look at a you know subgroup cross tab that seems crazy and then they say, ah, this doesn't make any sense. You know, of course this can't possibly be correct. I think if you average the polls and you maintain some degree of distance from it, you know, it's not the gospel truth, but it is a it's a data point. It, it, there's there's some signal there that there may also be noise. So I do think that polling has perhaps been unjustly skewered over the last period of time for some of its obvious misses. But on the other hand, uh, sometimes they've been pretty close to the mark, uh, and they may be this time as well. We ju we just don't know. But certainly, I wouldn't I wouldn't advise disregarding it because some of these findings seem implausible. Uh, we'll see. New girl. Right. Yeah. I guess we all see, but I, I think in recent elections, the polls have been well off in certain areas. I mean, especially when you consider the 2016 election. Okay, let me let me move well, on. Both to 2016 and 2020, they underestimated the Trump vote. Right. We'll see if that happens again. I mean, if that was true, then Biden's really in trouble. But anyway, that's a, neither here nor there. So this is a, a question that gets asked at every election cycle, but it's an important one. Um, mm -hmm. How do you keep the base satisfied and happy and willing to go out and vote and not just say, oh, forget it, and mm -hmm. then move to the middle? So you keep the left satisfied on issues like climate and immigration and whatever else, and yet mm -hmm. move to the middle to attract people who might otherwise not vote for you. Well, it's mathematically possible. Again, this is one of those things that is sort of a truism that if you reach out to the voters who are more in the center and you convert some of those voters to your way of thinking by being more moderate on whatever issue, climate or whatever, uh, and enough voters on the, you know, for the Democrats on the left of the party say, I'm not going to vote for you uh, because you, you didn't, you know, you changed your your position on this issue. I'm just going to stay home. It's unlikely these people vote for Trump, but they might vote for a third party. Mathematically, it's always possible that will happen, right? The question is, what's the trade-off between them? That's an empirical question. And most of the data that we have suggests that the trade-off is generally pretty good for moving toward the center, that taking more extreme, you know, sort of cleaving to the more left position or extreme position or extreme right position tends to like actually not do that much for your turnout, but you do wind up losing more voters in the center. And there's a simple fact that if you convert a swing voter from Republican to Democrat, that's a swing of two votes. If you turn out an additional Democratic voter, that's only one vote or a Democratic voter stays home. So my general sense of the data and the trends is that you are better off if you can be successful doing it trying to move to the center and converting people in the center and that the fall off you'll get in terms of turnout 
uh, or voting for third parties is is not going to be that great. And the sort of your your net effect will be positive. I mean, these are the trade offs politicians always have to make. And you know, look at something like climate. How many votes are there in the climate issue anyway? It's a it's it's even among eighteen to thirty four year olds. It's like you know three percent of of voters say it's like their most important issue. Most of the people who are climate zealots who are going to vote on the basis of climate only vote for the Democrats anyway. Uh, and there are not that many of them. So wouldn't you be better off trying to appeal to the voters in the center? Now, again, I emphasize it's mathematically possible. You can tell a story where the two things balance out in the other way. But that's my view. But I guess this gets at a bigger sort of existential question, which mm -hmm. is, what is the purpose of this at all? Is it just to win elections? Then in that case, yeah, abandon climate, abandon racial equity, abandon trans rights because, you know, they're not winning issues and we just want to win. Or do you want to lead on these issues because it's better for the world in general that we keep, uh, you know, warming down under two degrees, that it is better in general to have expanded access to civil rights than contracted access to civil rights, that it's better in general to be uh, a welcoming uh, country to, when it comes to immigrants than one that closes its borders down. You know, that that is actually the heart of who we are as Americans, or do we just want to win elections? Well, I mean, two, uh, two points to make here. One is if you don't win the elections, your ability to push ahead the issues you're concerned about are by definition undercut, if not destroyed, right? So there's a lot to be said for winning elections and winning a lot of them and staying in power long enough to do some of the things you need to do. And you may not, in fact, win those elections by having the maximum commitment to whatever thing you think is important. Like, for example, you know, if you believe you need a, a transition toward clean energy over time, are you going to do better on that if you like press the accelerator to the floor, even though voters don't care about it? And a lot of voters are much more interested in energy security and price than they are in climate change. Are, are you going to undercut your ability to actually move ahead over time on this clean energy transition? In other words, taking the most radical position or the position that seems morally you know, at least from your perspective, the best is not necessarily what produces the maximally a beneficial outcome, even for the issue you're concerned about. I also think there's an issue here of good and bad radicalism. I mean, not everything that, you know, some radical stances on a lot of these issues are, they're not even, they're not even things that would be good in and of themselves. Open borders wouldn't be good in and of itself. Uh, having a regime of trying to eliminate racial disparities through positive discrimination, through discrimination against the relatively privileged, which not is not a good idea. It's not a good way to run a country. It's not, you know, eliminating meritocracy is not actually a good, you know, policy idea. Um, a lot of the things that are currently associated with the trans movement are not good ideas, like medicalizing children. This, you know, arguably is a bad idea. You know, the idea of gender ideology and the whole concept that, you know, the, the, what sex you are is sort of optional and biological sex isn't that important, roundly rejected by the public and probably just wrong. So, you have to be careful both about how you're going to achieve the goals that you have in mind, the reasonable goals over time, like, for example, moving towards some sort of clean energy transition, and the and how you're going to achieve that, you know, effectively is through winning elections and then winning some more. Uh, and then also, what are the goals that you might have that actually aren't even very good goals and, in fact, are, are not radical in a good way, but radical in a bad way. So that, that's part of how I think about it. Um, not everything people are for who are on the left is good, but even the things that are for that are good <laughs> are things that actually can't be pursued unless you successfully build electoral coalitions that can win and then win again. Okay, we are over time. Uh, I, I think we could keep going forever and ever, but I want to sure. thank you for your time and your thoughts. And that was a great discussion. So thank you for being here with us. A pleasure. A very lively conversation. I was glad to mix it up. And Hey, everybody should take a look at where have all the Democrats gone, and I guarantee it'll it'll make you think of nothing else. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, well, it's been a great hour of thinking, so I appreciate that. Definitely tune in on Sunday. We'll have Michael Oren, former Israeli ambassador to the United States in conversation with Larry Mantle. That's at 11 a.m. Pacific. Thank you for sticking with us past our bedtime, and I'll see you next time.